Right. OK, well, thanks for everyone that's um, uh, dialed in. Um, we're a fairly sex group today, so um, we will rattle through. Um, I'm um, Malcolm Hull. I'm the chair of the, the Hearts and Middlesex branch of Butterfly Conservation. Um, what, what we're proposing to do today is just talk you through um, some, some of the a bit of information about butterflies um, in, the, in the area and, and then how you can get involved in recording butterflies and how you can get involved with, uh, with the branch. Um, what I'll do, um, first of all, is I'm going to introduce um, Liz Goodyear. Uh, Liz is uh, secretary of the group, um, one of our most enthusiastic butterfly spotters, a, a real expert on purple emperor and white letter hair streak, and, and often to be found at this time of year, staring at the tops of trees through binoculars. Liz is going to talk about um, the butterflies that we find in, in Hertfordshire and Middlesex and give some tips and things that you can do um, in the garden to help encourage butterflies. After that, we were going to have Andrew Wood, our county butterfly recorder, uh, giving some information on uh, recording butterflies and how to go about it. Unfortunately, Andrew's um, uh, not able to join us today, but uh, I'm standing as his replacement uh, and we'll be um, doing, doing that talk for you. I think altogether we'll probably be about 45 minutes um, and perhaps we'll, we'll stop if you've got any questions um, or comments then um, do either put them in the chat box or we'll stop and have uh, give you a chance for, for questions uh, at, at the end of each talk. So um, without further ado, I shall hand over to Liz and ask if um, she can uh, share her screen. Right, okay, this should be fun. Um, ba -do -ba -do. Um, no, it's not that. Where's it gone? Okay, sorry, Malcolm. This is uh, how come it turned up the other day quite perfectly, didn't it? Hold on. Yeah, I think it's the little button down. If you hover down towards the bottom of the screen, there should be a I've got a green box that says share screen. Yeah, I've hit that. It's just not coming up with what I want. Have you uh, have you got the presentation open? I am opening it now. Ah, that'll help. Right. Can you see that yet? No. No. <laughs> Oh, joy. Try again. Aha, there we are. Yep, it's appeared. It probably just needs to go into slide view. Yeah, great. Okay. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. If not, can you possibly, or if you can't see the pictures, can you just put some comment in the comments box? Um, this is the first time I've actually done a Zoom talk, believe it or not. I've listened to lots and lots of them, uh, but this is the first one I've actually done the talking. Now, my name's Liz Goodyear. I've been a member of the Hearts and Middlesex branch for at least 25 years and on the committee for 20. I'm a bit mad. I go out recording butterflies throughout the year, even in winter when you can find eggs. And today, actually, although Malcolm said I'm going to talk about the butterflies that you can find in Hertfordshire, I'm really going to just go through the common ones which you will encounter in your garden. Um, I'm if I talked about every single butterfly in Hertfordshire, I'd be talking for about a couple of hours and I think you might start getting bored. So here we go. Now, before I start telling you about the butterflies, I just want to give you some information about how you can find out what is flying at and when it is. We've got several means. Um, the main item is our branch website, 
uh, which the address is at the bottom. It will, you'll find it quite easily in Google if you haven't found the link already. The front page just tells you what's going on and some of the species that have been seen. And the main page that most people are interested in is the sightings page, which was take this is a screenshot from the 11th telling you that some people, have, somebody had seen purple emperors. Um, lots of sightings is updated on a daily basis by Peter Clark and all you need to do if you see something that you want to share with the branch you send an email to Peter. Other means we have a Facebook page um, that's run by Andrew Wood and that also has lots of information and the link is at the top of the screen and then we also have that's just some information he's got um, lots of videos that people have recorded which he posts on the Facebook page. And then we've got a Twitter account. Uh, this is the Twitter account. This is the one I use. Um, I retweet things and I just pick up things that I think people will find of interest. And hot off the press, just from the last couple of days, we now have an Instagram account. Um, it's called Hearts Middlesex Butterflies. It's still in sort of uh, a learning phase. We've just tried to link it up to the Facebook page today having forgotten our login details, hopefully it will link up and you'll be able to hear, see more things, more pictures. And we're also following the um, big city butterfly project, which is going on in London. So, and I'm also going to try and give you some clues as to how you can help encourage butterflies into your garden, uh, what type of flowers that you can plant. On the branch website we have a page dedicated to gardening for butterflies and although it's a few years old there's a page with the top 100 or top 99 most favoured um, plants that you could include in your garden. Obviously number one is Buddleia um, but Buddleia isn't in flower all the year, it's only in flower for perhaps from June until August. So throughout the year, you need to provide lots of nectar. Um, and this list gives a lot of suggestions. We now find that butterflies can be flying throughout the year, even in December and January. And if a butterfly does emerge during those months, it also needs to find nectar. So it's important to try and include things throughout the year, which are flowering. It's harder in the winter, uh, much, much harder. But from late autumn, you've got flowering ivy, the sedums, into early spring, you've got primroses, grey parsons, all sorts of things that if you add them to your garden planting list and they're in a sunny location, you might just be lucky enough to get some butterflies coming throughout the year. So I now want to explain, I don't know your experience, you might know all about butterflies, but I do want to just go through the basics and that includes starting from how boy, what happens when boy meets girl. Here we have a painted lady. Painted lady um, needs to, the male needs to mate with a female and the female will lay an egg. That egg will then become a caterpillar. That caterpillar will become a chrysalis. And you can see it forming and Depending on the species, it might just be a matter of weeks or it might be an entire year, it turns into a butterfly again. Now, it's got to be explained that every single butterfly has a different life cycle. Every single day, most butterflies have a unique food plant that the caterpillars eat and it is dependent on that caterpillar food plant being present to ensure that the butterfly turns up in your garden or the butterfly will be flying in the area. The cycle of a butterfly also varies. The illustration here is a painted lady. That might be only five or six weeks from adult through egg, through caterpillar, pupa or chrysalis to adult again. Another butterfly will lay an egg in the summer. That will stay as an egg all over winter and then hatch in the spring and then do the sequencing and become a butterfly perhaps sometime in the summer. Another butterfly will perhaps do it twice a year. Some butterflies will fly in the spring. Some butterflies will fly in the summer. Some butterflies will fly in the late summer and some butterflies will fly more than once during the year. 
So you cannot just manage, assume every butterfly does the same thing. So we, having followed that, we then have our seasons. As I was explaining, we have butterflies that will only fly in spring, um, in April or May. We have butterflies which will only fly in the summer and some in the late summer. But some of those spring ones we will be seen again. But one of them we have seen now this year and we won't see again probably until the next year. And for identification, I don't know if you're looking at my picture. Unfortunately, my scanner broke, so I couldn't add this. This is a field study guide, the Guide to the Butterflies of Britain. It's a laminated field guide. It has every British butterfly that you will find. And unlike a book, which is very bulky, it just puts it, you can either keep it in your kitchen, in a room in your house, see a butterfly in your garden, you don't recognize it, pick this up, rush out, and then hopefully you'll find it. But the problems with a book is they're heavy, they often list European butterflies, and of course, there's one you find, think you've found and you only find it's in the south of Greece. So, let's start here. Now this is, these are very common, well, say very common garden butterflies. Um, I will just, <laughs> I expect some of you will recognize them, but this is a peak, Peacock. The peacock emerged in the spring initially. It's a butterfly that hibernates, which is another thing that happens. Um, some, some of our butterflies actually spend the winter as adults in sheds, in ivy, in trees, just waiting for the spring and then they emerge. They then do all their mating and then reappear in the summer. Peacock uh, was flying a few weeks ago. It will be emerging a new generation of peacocks will be emerging any moment. Um, their larval food plant is stinging nettles, which is the same as a lot of other butterflies. I always say, you, unless you have a huge garden, you do not need to add stinging nettles to your um, garden at all. Um, they're invariably in a lane or somewhere near to your house on an open space. The, Criteria is that they do need to be in the sunshine and you need to ensure that the local council do not cut them all the time. If they cut the one, they can cut the ones in the shade because the butterfly won't be interested in the shaded location. But tr do try and encourage stinging nettles in your local area, but not necessarily, you don't need to worry about them in the garden. My next one here is the small tortoise shell. This again was a butterfly that hibernated over winter. Again, it feeds on, the caterpillars feed on stinging nettles. And we have them flying at the moment. They tend to have perhaps a couple of generations. So they're flying around the fields at the moment. I haven't seen one in my garden yet this spring or summer, but I'm hoping some of you will have. And the comma is another one, another butterfly that hibernates. Again, it feeds on stinging nettles, but it also feeds on other plants like elm tree, elm leaves, hop um, and sallow. So it's a little bit less fussy. Um, again, it's just flying at the moment, having emerged initially in the spring. And it gets its name. I don't know if you can see this with this lovely comma mark on its hind wing. Um, if you look at that shape, it looks like a dead leaf. So in the winter, it will spend its time hibernating in a tree, pretending to be a dead leaf and hoping that the spiders or some other creature won't get it. But the next one is the Red Admiral. Now, this is a bit more complex. The Red Admiral hibernates in the winter. But up to recent years, this was a migratory species that's only turned up if you in the summer about June time having flown up from North Africa but with our milder winters it's now staying here it's decided it quite likes living in England and up Wales and Scotland and it will most winters survive the winter this is why you do need to provide nectar throughout the year the red admiral will whereas the other butterflies I was illustrating that hibernate they hibernate really heavily they they have, seem to have a form of antifreeze that knocks them out. They're not interested in warm uh, winter days. 
Um, they wait until about March when the light levels and the temperatures rise and it gets brighter and then they start to emerge. The, P the Red Admiral will come out to fly on any warm winter day, especially if you've got a very sheltered garden. So it's not uncommon. We've had record sightings on the 31st of December and on the 1st of January. And this is where you do need to try and provide some nectar, available nectar um, throughout. Now, what you do in December and January is a bit difficult because flowering plants aren't really the norm. I suspect some of the winter jasmines, um, they will help. But certainly once February comes and you've got grey parsons, you've got primroses, um, Pulmeria lungwort is all very popular with um, for nectar for these um, overwinter these butterflies that emerge during the winter. And this is the painted lady. <clears throat> um, painted lady tends to almost certainly be a migratory species. It um, emerges. It flies up from North Africa. There was a really interesting TV program a few years ago following their progress um, being, they were tracking them coming up from, I think the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. You will get some years which are very, very good for painted ladies. Last year wasn't. We've had a sprinkling of sightings this year. They're easy to confuse with red admirals. They're more orange. They are totally manic. They're mad as hatters. They hurtle around. And whereas the other butterflies will use stinging nettles, Painted ladies need thistles. So if you find a field of thistles in a few weeks time, I reckon you'll probably see quite a lot of these butterflies. They will come in your garden. They will nectar. Um, all of the five species I've just shown you will nectar on buddleia. Uh, they'll nectar on sedums and a lot of the butterfly plants listed in that um, list I showed you earlier. Now, although buddleia is favoured these, by these five, it isn't favoured by every single butterfly. Um, there are a few that reject it. And also when we talk about buddleia, the garden centres send, sell a huge range of wonderful exotic buddleias as they do a lot of other plants. Butterflies tend to prefer the historic cottage garden um, lavenders, they prefer basic plants the old self-seeded buddleias that you find on wasteland are much preferable to the fancy dark coloured or ornate buddleias that the garden centres sell. Um, if you can get one that is late flowering that's also very good because then you've got um, late autumn flower heads and also if you really like gardening do prune your buddleia, do deadhead your buddleia because that will encourage some late autumn flowering. Now, having gone through the main garden ones, these are the whites. There are a lot of whites flying around at the moment. Um, if you like gardening, you may think these are pests. Um, they're also known as uh, sort of generally called cabbage whites. Um, but it should be said that the cabbage, the small white, <coughs> which is this one, this butterfly will eat your cabbages. Right. This is a green veined white, very, very similar, but it does not eat your cabbages. It feeds on members of the crucifer family. So it's very partial to a garden weed called garlic mustard, honesty, uh, cuckoo flower, any of those plants, it will lay its eggs on those and you will have a colony of green veined whites in your garden. Going back to the small white, if you want to try and identify the two, if you look at the small white, it just has a basic white, a basic pale yellow hindwing. And the green veined white has got quite a veined, heavily veined marking. The problem is when they're in flight or when you just see them with their wings open, it isn't always easy to tell them apart. I still struggle. So having been looking for butterflies for 20 years and I still struggle, it means that you are allowed to make mistakes and you don't have to learn them. Uh, you don't have to uh, remember which is which initially. Best way is if you've got a pair of binoculars, um, ideally close focusing binoculars, wait for one of them to stop and view them from a distance. If you get in close, they're just going to fly off and you're going to end up frustrated. And the final of these three large whites is three whites is the large white. Now the large white is also flying at the moment. Um, 
Now, it's fair to say this one also eats your cabbages, um, but it's fair to say that you can get small, large whites and you can get large, small whites. It can get quite difficult. But if you see one stopped and you can see this lovely highlighted wingtip, black wingtip, that will tell you you've got a large white. <clears throat> As you can see, this one is nectaring on lavender. So again, lavender is a very popular garden nectar source. And here we are, we've got the three white species, the key ones that are flying around. Uh, both small and large whites are flying at the moment. Green veined white probably is. I just haven't seen any. I don't think they're doing that well this year. But this is the species that has been around this year. This is the orange tip. This was flying back in April and May. Easy recognizable. This is a male with this beautiful orange tip. <clears throat> I had a friend ask, said I had a garden, a butterfly in my garden the other day. I don't know what it's called, but it had an orange tip to its wing. And I said, it's called an orange tip. Um, again, it feeds on similar plants to the green veined white, which is honesty, garlic mustard and cuckoo flower and I regularly have them laying eggs on my garlic mustard so I have a regular supply of orange tips. Very occasionally they have a second generation but um, this tends to be just one single brood finishing almost abruptly on the 1st of June. So unfortunately you're not going to see this one probably again this year but just to remind you that the female looks has is basically white with a grey black tip with a very mottled hind wing. And of course, if you look at that, and then you look at the hind wing of the green veined white, they look very, very similar. One of the best things to do is on a spring morning is to go out looking at the tops of um, the umbrella for cow parsley flower heads. And if you're really lucky, you might just see one roosting on the top of the flower head totally camouflaged by those mottling hind wings which just keep them hidden to all the prey. The other white butterfly is the brimstone. This is a bright yellow butterfly. It hibernates in the winter. It emerges in March on a sunny day, flies around for several weeks, um, even up to only a few weeks ago. <clears throat> it's done its stuff. It, the female has laid her eggs and again this one will be emerging very very shortly before it will quite abruptly go into hibernation as some of the earlier other ones do also go into hibernation quite early. Um, it's very partial to hibernating in ivy so it's very important to keep ivy in your garden or try not to cut it down. So many people are so keen to tidy ivy up um, cut it down and the flowering ivy is such an important spring autumn nectar source but that's for another butterfly in particular <clears throat> but this is the brimstone lovely yellow bright spring butterfly but just to confuse issues the male the female is actually more of a lime green pale white and can easily be confused with the large white but watch out for this in a few days in a few weeks even now um, <clears throat> the spring the summer generation isn't so easy to see um, it lays its eggs on order buckthorn or purging buckthorn which is a very anonymous shrub that is in the hedgerow i have got one in my garden it's quite prickly i have to keep it in control but I will ha regularly have females laying their eggs on it. They seem to be able to find it without, for some way, they can find it. They just simply know it's there and they will regularly be flying around it in around April and May laying their eggs uh, and then these will emerge as adults very shortly. As you can see that one is sitting on a primrose or a primula. So again spring nectar is very important for this species. They will nectar on all sorts of things in the spring and in the summer. I haven't seen them so much on Budlia, but there's a, I should imagine they do. But the, the summer generation are probably more into the fields and they're nectaring on some of the summer plants. Now, we're now going on to the browns. This is the speckled wood. This is one of the first brown butterflies to emerge in the year. They all use grass as their larval food plant. Some of them lay specifically on grass, some drop their eggs into grass, some lay on specific grass species and others couldn't care less what 
species they lay on, they just drop their eggs and hope that an adult will emerge eventually. But the speckled wood is a, basically a wooden species, but it will drop into your garden, especially if you've got some woodland nearby. Uh, started flying in April, um, it has various generations through the year, uh, building up into September when the numbers are at their peak and you'll find them all over the place. Um, but if you go down to a site like Broxbourne Woods or Brickett Wood, you'll almost certainly see them. They're not, as far as I know, flying too well at the moment. We're probably waiting just for another generation. Nectar, they're not that specific. They love just taking up territory on a bramble bank in a wood. Um, another speckled wood comes in and they will just hurtle after them and tell them to go and find another bramble bank. That's the, the males are very territorial. <clears throat> Gatekeeper and the meadow brown. These are both flying at the moment in Hertfordshire and Middlesex. They're one generation butterflies emerging. First of all, the meadow brown emerged just at the beginning of June. The gatekeeper has just started to emerge. They look terribly similar. They will both come in your gardens. Um, meadow browns will nectron badly. Gatekeepers are very partial to lavender and marjoram. So another plant to add to your garden list is marjoram. But again, try and get the uh, old traditional versions or almost wild marjoram if you can. Again, with uh, the meadow browns, they will nectron all sorts of things. If you've got some knapweeds, scabious, these are all plants that you can add to your garden list. Scabious is again a very, very popular plant for nectaring. Um, again, you need to try and get the field scabious or devil's bit rather than the very fancy ones that got, uh, garden centres um, sell you. Um, Scabious is a chalkland, generally a chalkland species, but I've got clay and it thrives. I've got lots of it in my garden. It's all falling over everywhere, but the butterflies love it, as do the bees. Uh, bees don't seem to worry too much about um, what to nectar on, whereas butterflies are quite particular. But here we have we've got the meadow brown and the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is slightly smaller um, and the markings are much brighter. Um, it's old name was the hedge brown but the gatekeeper is very apt it's very often at the entrance to a field on a bramble bank holding territory whereas a meadow brown will find itself throughout the fields it will be in the middle of the field on the edge of the field but the gatekeeper tends to be always on the edge and this is the hind wings much simpler much plainer just one eye spot uh, gatekeeper double eye spot and a little this is sort of white cream line here with these two dots. Um, <clears throat> meadow brown, as I said, is just a bit bigger. It's very difficult to tell in flight when you're new to butterfly recording, but in time you do get the hang of it. The gatekeeper looks more orange when it's fresh. And this is a ringlet. Again, it's just flying at the moment. I think it's one of the most beautiful butterflies when fresh. Look at these it's got this beautiful cream margin, these eye spots here, chocolate brown, <clears throat> terribly similar to the meadow brown when seen in flight, but it looks, when it's fresh, it's just chocolate brown. I followed one around my garden a few days ago. I knew it was one because the other thing with the ringlet is it never stops. If I'm doing this talk in a hall, I will explain to you, but it just bobs along bobs along and never stops and you can follow it for ages before eventually you might just get it to stop and you can quickly see those rings again it's experience that tells you when you're looking at a ringlet <clears throat> but it it comes eventually after about 20 years sorry <laughs> and finally the marbled white um excuse me whilst i just have some water marbled white again is flying at the moment it's really nice to be doing a talk when they're all flying usually i used to do talks in the winter when you just have to tell people what to expect in the summer. It looks like the nectaring is on an orchid, which is even beautiful, but this is a fabulous butterfly. It is a member of the brown family. Um, once upon a time, it was really quite a rare species in Hertfordshire. Now it is very, very widespread. I've had it in my garden in Ware, <clears throat> whereas a few years ago, it was, was just wasn't even present in the east of the county but now it's coming from the west it's coming from the east it's come down from the north and it's creeping south into London 
<clears throat> so it's very widespread and it's a superb butterfly. It, the, it still feeds on grass, it feeds on red fescue, which I couldn't tell you what that looks like, but I just know that's what the books say. Um, but I assume it's a bit more scarce and that's why it's been harder to find in the past. And this little creature is a small heath. I've included it because I, until the other day, I never expected to see one in my garden. I didn't see it, but my husband assures me it was one. It is the smallest of the um, England's browns. Um, it again lays its eggs on grass, but it needs fine grass. Until a few years ago, it was in really serious decline, but our nice dry summers that we have had in the past year, not this year, um, seem to be very favourable and it's turning up in all sorts of places. Um, I was so surprised last year to find it was only on a, a scrappy piece of grassland about 50 yards from my house, which is why when my husband said he'd seen one, I believed him. Um, I, don't all, I don't always believe him, but uh, I did on this occasion and I will submit it as a record. So it was a garden first. Um, <clears throat> now these, believe it or not, are butterflies. These are called the skippers. We've got three skippers, <coughs> three skippers that are likely to be seen in your garden. There are other skippers which are much scarcer. Uh, again, these feed on grass, the well, caterpillars feed on grass. As you can see, this one is feeding on bramble. Bramble again is a very, very popular nectar source for a lot of butterflies. Again, unless you've got a very large garden, <clears throat> we wouldn't expect you to convert your garden to a bramble patch, but hopefully you've got some nearby and this would be a really good place to go and look for butterflies, especially if it's in the sun. And even when the fruit are forming and starting to rot, some of the butterflies will actually uh, take feed off the rotting brambles. Um, so, you know, it has a multitude of um, purposes, bramble. Um, it acts as shelter for some of our rarer species on sites. So don't, again, if you are wor wor working with conservation, uh, please try and look after the bramble banks. So often you see them being cut down because people think they're a nuisance, but for butterflies, they think they're the best things since sliced bread. So this is the large skipper. It was the first one to emerge uh, just at the beginning of June. Um, it's slightly larger than the other two I'm just about to show you. It's got a checkerboard marking, favours the edge of the um, fields. It loves the bramble banks. It loves the field edges. Um, it hurtles around. If you see something orange darting around, it's most likely to be a skipper. They get their name because they do not stop. They are really quite hard to identify for inexperienced people, but it gets worse. We have the small anesthetic skipper. Um, some people say they can tell the difference quite easily. Um, I can assure you that it is extremely hard. The books will tell you it's all in the antennae, uh, which if you look at this one, which is a small skipper, it's got only a very slight black point and the Essex skipper looks like it's been dropped in a pot of ink. Now, there is a difference. It was one of the Essex skipper was one of the last um, butterflies to be recognized as a separate species. It's because the larval stage and the caterpillar, the caterpillar and the egg stage are different. Uh, again, I can't remember exactly which way it is, but the small skipper emerges sooner earlier because it has spent the winter in a different form. And the books will remind me if I look in a book, I'll be reminded which form it is. But there are other ways. <clears throat> now, this is a small skipper. And if you look here, I think I've probably got another image here. Yeah. If you look here, you've got this sepia tip to the wing, which if you actually manage to get a small skipper to stop, you should be able to see. It is not present on the Essex skipper. There are some difference in markings, but also here is slightly band, slightly bowed. And well, all I can say is they are seriously hard. They're both flying at the moment. They both use grass as their love or food plant and they're both very small. So, but you might just see one in your garden if you're lucky. And this is the holly blue. This is the only blue that most people see in the garden. There are other blues, 
but they are not so commonly seen in the garden. There are quite a lot of species that may turn up in your garden, but you are very lucky when they do. The holly blue has two generations. It was flying a few weeks back in the spring. Um, the first generation lays their eggs on holly flowers and the second generation, which will emerge very shortly, will lay their eggs on ivy, which of course is why ivy is so important because it will lay its eggs on the ivy flowers. Um, it's a small butterfly, it's small blue. Some people think, oh, it's a small blue, but it's a small blue butterfly. Um, it flies quite high. It will fly through your garden along the hedge line. You quite often see it in supermarket car parks for some reason. And it, as I say, it loves ivy and it will love holly. It also feeds, we believe it feeds on dogwood and it feeds on um, dogwood and bay trees. Nectaring is a little harder. It's not a great one for stopping. What it does do sometimes, it comes down to take moisture off a leaf or say fry the pond, it will come down by the pond. One landed on my husband one day and thought he was quite tasty as well. But I think um, hopefully I've given you some ideas about what you might see in your garden. There are a lot, as I said, there are a lot more other butterflies flying, but I don't want to go on for too long tonight. Um, and I hope I've given you some ideas of what to plant in your garden. Um, it's a matter of making sure it's in the sunshine. Um, if it's in the shade, butterflies aren't interested in nectaring in the shade that it does need to be sunny but um anyway and finally um these are some moths these are all moths i've recorded in my garden um it means that not all moths are brown and boring and they certainly do not all eat your clothes uh, it was in the papers again about clothes being eaten there's actually about two very small moths that eat clothes the rest are quite happy to and content to eat other herbaceous plants, um, all sorts of things. Um, so these are, this just for information, this is an emperor moth. This is a Jersey tiger, which will be flying in our area very soon. It's been added to the big butterfly count uh, checklist. Um, I see numerous Jersey tiger in my garden. This is a puss moth. Look at its lovely paws, I think it's gorgeous. And this is an eyed hawk moth. You cannot get better than that. And so that, I think, is it. Thank you, Malcolm. Great. Well, thanks, Liz. Um, that was um, really interesting. And um, yeah, it gives some good ideas of things we can um, do in our gardens in order to, um, to help moths and butterflies. Um, I did say I'd take any questions at this stage. If, if anyone has got a, a question they'd like to ask Liz, then uh, do do unmute and uh, feel, feel free to ask it. Um, I see there's four, four things in chat, so I don't know, I haven't looked at that. Um, yeah, there's some comments saying thank you for your talk, but not any not any uh, questions. But uh, if any if anyone does want to ask a question, then um, then please do um, do unmute and ask it. In a, in a moment, I'm going to go on and do tell you a little bit about um, recording butterflies, why we do it, and how how you can contribute. Um, right, so um, in order to do that, I shall uh, share my screen. There we go. Um, don't think anyone has anyone got a question that they asked. No, doesn't look like it. Um, there will be another opportunity to um, to ask questions at uh, at the end, so um, you will get another chance. You just there we go. Um, Right, so I'm not Andrew Wood. Uh, as I said, uh, for those of you here at the start, unfortunately, Andrew is not able to be with us today, but I'm, I'm Malcolm Hull and I will be giving his talk for him. Um, so starting off, why, why do we record butterflies? Well, um, first of all, and I think most importantly, it's a really enjoyable um, way of, of, um, of spending our time. There's, there's nothing, nothing better than being out in the countryside or your garden um, looking at nature 
uh, and it's a uh, it's really nice to be able to do that and we get loads of people probably i think in our last last annual report we had over six thousand people sending in records of uh, butterflies just in our two counties which is uh, quite amazing and i think in the uh, the big butterfly count which is the national um exercise that's conducted each year we we have uh, well over a hundred thousand people recording so it's uh it, it's becoming a very popular hobby um and something which um it'd be great for to for you to get involved with and to start submitting records um we the reason we do it is really to to try and give us an information starting point we need to know what butterflies we got, where they are, uh, and how many that how many of them are flying, and having that basic data, um, then we can we we can use that as a basis for making conservation decisions, deciding which species are are declining, trying to work out why, and then taking action uh, in order to help them. You know, butterfly conservation is very much. Um, an evidence-based scientific organisation. So we we use the data um, that you provide to help us really understand the trends in butterfly population um, and also by seeing which sites they do well on and which sites they do, don't do so well on, we can start to understand the butterfly's habitat needs and, and, and what, what sort of habitat different species will, will thrive in. And we've now got, uh, after 50 years of uh, running the charity, we've got a pretty good, uh, pretty good understanding of what a lot of the butterflies need in order to thrive. Um, we're still some way off that, I suspect, with uh, the uh, two and a half thousand moth species in, in the UK. But we are starting to get um, a much better uh, scientific understanding of, of the species, um, which ones, we, you know, what their requirements are and which ones need help. And that really gives us a good, uh, not only for our local branch, but also nationally, a good basis for making conservation decisions. So record, recording and understanding is vital. Um, so what is a record? Um, well, it, it's very pretty simple. There's, a, there's very few pieces of data we need. Um, first of all, the date on which the sighting is made. Um, the place or a grid reference um, are probably best or alternatively a postcode or if you're familiar with it there's an app called what three words that can describe um, every every uh, every three meter square anywhere on the planet with with three words um, which is quite a good quite a good uh, reference tool as well we need to know the species of the butterfly that you've seen um, you know if you're not sure of the species then after, after examining it, then a, a photograph will help um, us determine that. Um, we need to see the number of butterflies you've seen, and, and lastly, we need to see the name of the recorder. So, though, those those are the, the crucial bits of information that we're looking for for a record. Um, in terms of how to how to report a record in, um, probably the best way uh, now is through um, an app on your on your phone. The, the, the app we use the year all year round is called I Record Butterflies. That's a free app that can be downloaded um, from the App Store. Um, and once you've logged into it, it's fairly straightforward and easy to use. And all the data that, that is, uh, is put in there is verified by county butterfly recorders and used in order to um, inform the, uh, the distribution maps that we publish. Um, you can see a picture of the um, picture of the app on the top top left of the screen there. That's uh, the, the home screen when it's open. Um, at the traditionally um, down below that, you can see a little notebook with lots of squiggles in it. That's that's the old fashioned way of, of recording butterflies, and a lot of people will still do that, um, and then perhaps enter the information in into to an app or a database subsequently. Um, you know, if we do, if you do record in your own little notebook, but you don't 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 want to rec report using the app, then um, an Excel spreadsheet um, is is a is an easy tool for us to use. Or if 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 that's uh, if that's difficult, then just a 
a sheet of paper with the with the the basic data that we've I've described um, written out on it, so that we can um, input the data ourselves. But if if you are able to do the electronic data inputting, that is a big help to us because you because you can imagine with six thousand people recording each year, that's a lot of data for us to um, us, us to assemble. Um, <laughs> So what happens to the records once you've submitted information? Well, um, I think the, we, are, they, we use the data um, to inform the conservation, as I've already said. The, uh, our data is, um, is shared with um, wildlife recording um, centres um, locally. And, and there, I think there's uh, the, the two main ones in our area are called Giggle, which is uh, an amusing acronym for the, the Green Space Information in Greater London. That, that's the, effectively the Environmental Recording Centre for London, covers the whole of Greater London. And there's also HERC, the Hertfordshire Environmental Record Centre, which holds um, records for all, all um, biological species in Hertfordshire and is hosted by the um, Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust. Um, we also have our own local butterfly conservation database, um, where, which all the all the data is put into, where it's processed and used for the uh, production of an, our annual reports, which I'll come on to. Um, there's also uh, a butterflies for the new millennium national database, which is butterfly conservation's national store of information, um, and the, the United and the United Kingdom butterfly monitoring scheme. Um, which runs a couple of specialist systems. Um, you, you may have heard of people walking a transect, which is a, a systematic timed walk, which takes place at the same time um, each week over the course of the season and records the, the butterflies that, uh, that are seen. So you, over a series of identical walks over a, uh, the course of a year and over several years, you get a very reliable uh, impression of how butterfly species are doing on, on an individual site. Um, we use the information um, to respond when, when we're consulted in relation to um, habitat management plans and sometimes for planning applications. When, when we talk, we, we as a group, we do respond to consultations that come out from local authorities and other environmental bodies trying to make sure that butterflies and moths are um, properly taken into account when things are being planned because I think what, what we find is that um, if people are planning some farming activities or some forestry activities or house building activities um, or just some general habitat management for birds or mammals then thinking about butterflies and moths doesn't really come very high in their, um, uh, in, in their thinking. But if, if you spend a little bit of time talking to people and they realize that making a few not too expensive changes can actually have a big difference in terms of how, how good a site is for, for butterflies and moths, then usually they're provided you speak to them politely enough, they're, they're willing to do that. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of the work we do as a group is trying to, uh, I suppose, act as a lobbyist on behalf of butterflies to try and um, make sure that we do get um, a, good, um, a, a good, ha good habitats for them to live in. Um, so moving on. Um, yeah, the recording schemes. Um, I've mentioned the um, the I record butterflies um, uh, already. Butterflies for the new millennium is the is the system for recording the the trans weekly transect data. Um, you know, we run about sixty or seventy transects in our area. Some of them walk by just one person, and some of them walked by a whole um, whole series of people that take it in turns. It's, it's a very rewarding activity and uh, once once you've got your butterfly spotting um, uh, down 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 fairly fairly well honed then it's a good thing to do but probably not for beginners um, site recording um, can take place anywhere you can record a butterfly in your garden or in the local park or absolutely anywhere and we're very happy to um, have it ever reported. We have a specialist garden butterfly survey which um, records the sort of early and, and late sightings and the number of species you find in, in your own garden. Um, and we're always grateful for people that will sign up to, uh, to do that. 
And of course, the big butterfly count is a, is a very high profile um, exercise that takes place over three weeks in July, starting um, fairly shortly, I think 16th of July, it's starting this year. So it, it will be um, no doubt be on the news. It usually has a, a high profile launch to try and encourage as many recorders as present. Um, again, you can download an app um, in, in order to, um, to, to register for that and to, to, to do some butterfly counting. Um, in uh, wherever you happen to be during the three week period when it's on. Um, the, the few more, you wouldn't believe the number of butterfly recording schemes there are, but uh, the migrant watch is, is, is one that uh, is spe specifically focused on um, uh, schemes to, for, for, for looking at uh, butterflies and moths, which are migrants into this country. And they're, they're interesting because sometimes they come in huge numbers and other times they hardly show up at all. Um, so very variable, um, but also quite interesting, not just when they come, but also whether they breed here and, and some of them even fly back to um, warmer countries in the, um, in, in the autumn. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting one to be involved with. Um, Wilder Countryside Butterfly Counts is, a, is, a, is another one which is based on a random series of squares out in the countryside and again quite an easy system to do as, a, as an early early start and transect recording I've, um, I've spoken about already. Um, so using, using the records in the publication, the one on the left is the uh, our annual report, um, Hertfordshire and Middlesex Butterflies. Those of you that were members um, in, um, in March and February should have, uh, should have received a copy of this as it gets mailed out as a hard copy to all members. If, if for any reason you haven't received a copy and you would like one, then uh, please do contact um, either myself or, or Liz um, afterwards and we'll, we'll be happy to make sure you get one. The, the, do, the document on the right is, a, is actually a, a far bigger publication. It's Andrew Wood's book on the butterflies of Hertfordshire Middlesex, which is the, um, the, uh, the only book that's ever been uh, published on the bus, on butterflies of the two counties together. Um, and the, the first for either county since um, the mid 1980s. And that really is a, 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 the Bible, if you like, for, um, for, for information about uh, local butterflies. Um, it's, it's available for sale through from the publishers, which is the, uh, the Hertfordshire um, Natural History Society um, via their website. Um, so you would have thought with all that information we have um, on butterflies, we should know everything, um, but uh, we don't. Um, this, 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 is a, this, this chart here is showing distribution map from um, what, the one on the left is from the the 1980s surveys of Hertfordshire and Middlesex and shows the uh, the distribution of the wall brown butterfly um, that one pictured in the middle, um, which in the 1980s was extremely common. Um, uh, the, the 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 chart on the on the right shows its current distribution over the last 15 years, which uh, basically shows that it has disappeared altogether. Um, and uh, although we do know a lot about butterflies, we still don't really know why the wall brown has disappeared. As it has gone from one of our top 10 most common butterflies to, to one that has, has completely gone from our area. And nowadays it, it tends to be found either in the north of England or around the um, around coastal areas. Um, but why it's, why, it's, why it's gone there and left us, we don't really know. Um, but it does show just how important it is to um, to be on top of recording butterflies or, or we would never realize just how uh, how these things are changing and that's is the end of andrew's talk um thank you very much for everyone that has uh, has, has stayed this long uh again if if there are any questions then do um feel free to uh, unmute yourself and um and ask a question or um make a comment um but um, I guess if, um, if there aren't any, then I shall just say thank you ever so much for, uh, for joining. It's a, a small but very select high quality audience. Um, we do um, very much welcome everyone to come along to, uh, to join us with our, our, our events. We've got a, still got several butterfly walks going on um, over the next few weeks and you can um, you can see our um, program in the um, 
on, it's, all, it's always available via the branch website. So you can um, have, a, have a look at it there. Oops, got slides back. Just trying to, let me see. My stop screen she's scaring. And then do that. So thank you for your kind comments that uh, everyone has made. That's uh, that's really great. Nice to be appreciated. So um, thank you ever so much for um, for joining and um, we shall we shall hope to see you at one of our events. We will be um, doing some more Zoom talks probably early in the new year. Um, we hope we'll also be back to be doing more indoor talks. Uh, we usually have our, our annual members day in um, in March. So, so look out for that. You will get um, a couple of um, newsletters come through from the branch dur during the year, um, which will have a, lots of facts and figures and information on, but to, to keep in touch on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the best way is to, um, to look, at, look at the branch website, um, particularly the sightings page of the website, it's very interesting, and the, the home page, which we try and put all the news on. Um, we don't, uh, don't like really to drown our members with lots of emails, so, so you, you won't get a, a steady stream of emails from us, but um, if, you, if you want to keep in touch, then, um, it's really good to be um, to be looking at the, at the branch website, but also the Facebook and the the Twitter account, and now the Instagram account, which uh, Liz mentioned as well. Um, and uh, not last, not least, the YouTube channel um, where we where we've got videos of uh, quite a few of the talks we've done over the last um, last few months, um, and where this one will be added fairly shortly. So you can watch it again if you if you missed anything. So thanks very much for coming and um, cheerio.